So, my name is Mark, and I'm a software engineer here. And I've just recently joined the team a few months ago. And I'm here today to talk to you a little bit about VoIP fraud. This is going to be a more academic discussion, pretty light on technical details. So, first, I'll give you a brief history on telecom fraud. Phone freaking has been around since the 50s. Um, it started because of deficiencies in the way early automated switches worked. They used in-band signaling and just different tones to basically tell the system what to do. So uh, people would make homebrew <coughs> electronics uh, that were referred to as boxes, and they were referred to by different colors based on their capabilities. An example is the red box, which was used to generate tones that would simulate people putting coins into a payphone. So you could essentially place free calls. Another example is the orange box, which was used to spoof caller ID, something that is still a problem today and is actually a lot easier now that we have VoIP. And probably the most famous example is the blue box which emitted a 2600 hertz tone that would trick the long distance trunk into thinking that one end of the call had been hung up and it would allow you to essentially place free long distance calls by sending tones that corresponded to the number to fool it into dialing out for you. And that's a picture I just ripped off of Wikipedia. It was the only one I could find an example of. So. These early methods were rendered obsolete by a switch to out-of-band signaling and also digital equipment. And basically by the 90s, they were ineffective for the majority of phone systems. Um, right around that time, however, VoIP started emerging as a new technology. And as the phone systems evolved and VoIP evolved, as did the methods of fraud. So. Fraud today. VoIP is obviously much more powerful than switched phone systems, and as such, it provides a much greater surface area for potential attackers. And as well, the impact is generally much greater, um, larger, and more coordinated criminal enterprises are now exploiting these systems for financial gain. And obviously, computer automation makes this potentially a lot easier and more efficient on the part of the attacker. So there's been a trend, you know, initially the people that were making these boxes were sort of hackers and actually a lot of famous people, Steve Jobs, Steve Wozniak. Um, and it was sort of, I don't want to say harmless, but not as malicious as it has become nowadays. So some estimates as far as the cost impact of fraud. In 2013, according to the Communications Fraud Control Association, I feel like there's an extra word that should be there. OK. <laughs> anyway, they estimated the cost of toll fraud at $46 billion in 2013, which represented a 15% increase over 2011. So this primarily is affecting small businesses the hardest, typically because they can't afford to refund people that are defrauded, and they also usually cannot afford to throw a lot of money at this problem to help prevent fraud in the first place. So now I'm just going to discuss some types of VoIP fraud so that we have a little bit of a better understanding of the ways that people are defrauding uh, companies and users in this day and age. International and premium number fraud is probably the biggest and it can be used obviously to make free calls or rather that's the intent often um, but more so it's used for criminal organizations to make money which is uh, essentially what they will do is get a premium number in some foreign country somewhere of which they get a small percentage of the charges and then you know the company itself would get the remainder and their goal then becomes to route as many fraudulent calls to these numbers as possible. So it's a very organized crime and there are um, 
no longer just people trying to get free calls. It's now, uh, as the other slide demonstrated, a billion dollar um, you know, industry, I guess you might say. Also, impersonation and social engineering. And this is primarily uh, caller ID spoofing. And a lot of people don't even realize that you can change the caller ID of a call very easily. So it becomes a very powerful tool to help fool people into thinking that uh, they're talking to a trusted third party when, in fact, it's some illegitimate attacker. So uh, they can easily or more easily be convinced to divulge you know, credit card information or something of that nature. And also, it can be used to attempt to fool people into calling back a premium or long distance number by placing a call with a fraudulent caller ID and then hanging up quickly and then trying to trick the person into calling back to see who it was. So this, unfortunately, because it exploits mostly human weakness, is very difficult to guard against. And technically speaking, you cannot prevent caller ID spoofing because once you hit the carrier, it assumes the caller ID has been vetted at the origin and it has no way of vetting the caller ID, so you pretty much have to blindly accept what you're given, and it can't, you can't guard against it. And then finally, simple service degradation and denial of service attacks. And this uh, is just when the attacker attempts to overload the system with bogus requests or even legitimate requests at just a very high volume. Uh, some examples of this are registration attempts with no key, um, when you send a registration attempt, you have to generate the server has to generate and store a key temporarily. So if you were to burst a lot of these attempts in and then not respond and uh, cause the server to fill up storing all these keys, it could uh, crash. And then also uh, overloading servers with unresolvable DNS is another thing. Um, if you just use some nonsense, you know, host name, the server still has to obviously go out and check to see if it can resolve that host name. So this can cause delays in processing legitimate requests if you spam enough of these in. And then even spamming legitimate invites can be a problem. And they don't have to be real calls, or they could be real calls with Rick Astley looping in the background just to occupy people and generally be annoying. Um, there are a lot of creative ways that <laughs> you can fool people and just waste their time. Um, and basically deny service. So now we're going to talk about some slightly more specific methods of fraud and how these people attempt to attack systems. So the first step is enumeration or scanning. You have to obviously find vulnerable systems or potentially vulnerable systems to exploit. Uh, one popular tool is called Friendly Scanner. And as you can see here, uh, we actually have a log line from one of our Camellio servers uh, that someone was attempting to scan with Friendly Scanner. They haven't even bothered to change the user agent, which still says Friendly Scanner. So these people oftentimes don't even need to be really sophisticated about it. Um, obviously, this attempt was easily blocked, but you could receive more stealthy attempts. Um, sometimes when you have a phone that's externally visible, uh, you may just get nonsense calls. So for example, uh, I'm told a bunch of people often call up support and say, hey, this phone's been ringing nonstop and the caller ID says extension 100, which is apparently a common attack tool that does that. And they say, what's going on here? Well, you're being <laughs> scammed by someone who's running automated calls against the system. PBX dial through or forwarding is a potentially very expensive way of attacking a system. Um, it's placing a call to a business and then attempting to exploit the PBX to reroute that call to an external or premium number. Um, this is, can be done if the PBX is improperly configured, such as allowing callers to perform transfers uh, or you know through voicemail sometimes. and um, Basically, the business is charged for the cost of these calls because it looks like that's where it originated. So this is another thing where uh, once a vulnerable system is identified, the attack can be automated and that greatly amplifies the effects and the costs to the business. 
Also, you can attempt to register fraudulent devices on the PBX, which re relies on exploiting a weakness in the credentials or default credentials, which a lot of people often don't change. Uh, this is the type of attack that's very easy to automate, and uh, it's also very easy to detect if you're monitoring for it, and that is something you should definitely do. And then there's server-based attacks. Because modern VoIP systems are essentially computer servers in data centers, you have security vulnerabilities in the server software and operating system that can also be exploited. And once you have access to the server, obviously it's very easy to exploit the phone system that's running on it. And also the system, the phone system software itself can be exploited. And a good example of that is uh, security vulnerability AST 2008003, which was a vulnerability found in Asterisk in 2008, which allowed a specially crafted from headers to trigger uh, outbound calls from the system. So there's things like that that you also have to worry about. And the, I'm sorry. And so, yeah, any other services running on the server as well are potentially vulnerable. So you have to watch out and attempt to minimize those. And then furthermore, you can attack phones themselves, which are small computers nowadays, most running embedded Linux distributions. Um, and weak voicemail passwords would also count as a phone-based attack. You know, a four-digit voicemail password can be cracked even at a relatively moderate pace in a few hours. Um, so automated password guessing makes having strong and correctly sized passwords very important. And um, caller ID spoofing is also another way that could uh, lead to voicemail access. If the system just looks at the caller ID and matches it against the number you're calling and sees they're the same, uh, sometimes you can access voicemail without even having to put in a password. And uh, there's several high-profile examples of this, a lot of celebrities and uh, government employees and things of that nature. It's uh, a widespread problem. So configuration pages can also be exploited. A lot of phones you can uh, find are externally configurable via a web page, and oftentimes people either don't know that or don't change the password, so it's still the default. And then you can uh, attack people themselves, not with a baseball bat, but you uh, use social engineering and coax them into providing information uh, either to further exploit the system or to just steal from them. Um, and this is very hard to guard against, obviously, because education is really the only effective weapon against this type of attack. Um, luckily for most people and businesses, um, these attacks are usually only damaging to the people themselves. So it's sort of their own fault for not knowing better, but it's still important to educate people to a certain degree to prevent them from compromising your system inadvertently. So we're gonna talk about some general tips to avoid and mitigate these attacks. And obviously, the easiest is to avoid being the low-hanging fruit here. Uh, as we saw with the earlier log line, a lot of these attackers are not super sophisticated. So if it's not easily externally exploitable, uh, they'll pass you over. It's not going to be as easy to repel a very targeted attack, but a lot of these uh, general scans occur all the time on any devices that are internet-facing. So uh, tightening your configuration and permissions and um, basically securing your system so that it has the least amount of external visibility necessary for normal operation is going to allow you to avoid a great majority of these attacks. And network and server security is very important in that. And you wanna make sure that you have correctly configured firewalls, SBCs, uh, anything that's external facing and basically uh, filter out as much traffic as possible and certainly filter out traffic from known bad addresses, obviously, uh, once you determine that a particular IP is uh, attempting to register with a number of different passwords, um, blacklisting that IP would be a good practice. And uh, keeping your servers patched and up to date, you know, this is, sounds like common sense stuff for a lot of people, but um, it is often overlooked. 
and then just ensuring the minimum number of services are running on servers that are hosting your system. Some more kazoo specific tips and the talk James just gave on uh, limits is a great example. Um, you know, use limits, secure your phones. Uh, the new provisioner is good for this. It will force you to use a different user and administrator password. It will force you to change your SIP port so it's not the default. And it will force firmware that is up to date. So that's very important and uh, it's very easy to use as well. So that's definitely a recommendation. And then again, limits. Um, using limits is going to allow you to mitigate the effects of any attack, specifically uh, sub-accounts. If a sub-account is compromised, you want to make sure that the limit is low enough so that it doesn't cost you know, a ton of money. Um, you can't always necessarily prevent sub-accounts from making easy mistakes, so it's important to limit the potential impact. And then um, blocking classifiers are another great idea. Uh, high rate and international numbers, uh, you can block them if you're not expecting to make any international calls. There's no reason to even allow them in the first place. And uh, infrastructure as a service installs have even more detailed classifiers uh, that can allow you to restrict things uh, even better. Real-time monitoring is probably the most important thing to do to mitigate these attacks. Um, we have carriers that block repeat calling to high rate areas, for example. Um, if you make 100 calls to Saudi Arabia, it's going to get blocked automatically and then flagged for further investigation. Um, and it's really essential to know what your system is doing and what the typical behavior looks like. Um, if you normally only expect a certain number of registrations in a given time period, it's very easy to notice that you've got a spike in registration attempts which could indicate an attack. And the same goes with invites and any other form of legitimate traffic. So it's just important to know what your system normally does and keep tabs on it. And a lot of people uh, do do this, and that's very good, but a lot of people also overlook you know, simple monitoring like this. And this kind of detection can be very easy to automate as well. Um, you, know, you can grep through the logs and just sum up you know, registers, for example. Um, so it's easy to do, but it's often overlooked, and it has a very, very good chance of stopping attacks in progress and before they become very serious. And finally, uh, user education. This is important because most attacks against users can't be guarded against you know, in an automated fashion. So informing people, say, hey, if you're getting a bunch of calls from extension 100, they're probably not legitimate. Um, and also just informing people in general that, hey, you can't trust caller ID. Um, the more people you have that are just aware of the possibilities, and the more people are going to be at least somewhat on guard if strange things start happening and not immediately assume that it's a problem with the phone system or uh, something like that, but it could be something nefarious. So uh, that is it. Anyone have any questions? Didn't think so. <laughs> All right. Thank you.